Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Insights Virtual Public Lecture. I'm British Academy Global Professor of Children's Literature here at Newcastle University, Karen Sands O'Connor, and I'm pleased to be able to welcome you to tonight's event. Our guest speaker tonight is the multi-talented children's and young adult book author, Patrice Lawrence. And Patrice was born in Brighton, raised in an Italian Trinidadian family, and her books reflect this multi-ethnic, multiracial version of Britain. And they've been rightly awarded for doing so. From the very first, her debut novel, Orange Boy, in 2016, which won the Booksellers YA Book Prize and the Waterstones Book Prize for Older Readers. She's also been nominated for numerous other awards, including the Costa Children's Book Award, and this year, the inaugural Jollock Children's and Young Adult Book Prize for her novella, Eight Pieces of Silver. She's been a judge for, of Children's Book Prizes herself, including for the Little Rebels Prize. She's published for all ages of readers, including for younger readers, uh, stories such as Granny Ting Ting. For middle grade readers, she has published historical fiction such as Diver's Daughter and school stories, uh, including an original story in the Mallory Tower series. And her YA is rightly acclaimed across the children's book world, uh, most recently with her novella Rat. I will be back after the lecture for a live Q&A with Patrice. And if you would like to submit a question, we'd like to have it. And you may do so through the YouTube live chat box on your screen or via Twitter at InsightsNCL. I know you're going to enjoy tonight's lecture with the wonderful Patrice Lawrence. And so without further ado, here she is. Hello, my name is Patrice Lawrence. And welcome to my talk um, from All Writers Matter to Zadie Smith via Badgers. And I just have to say the Badgers will be fleeting. I don't want to sort of raise your expectation with Badgers. I'll be talking about my experience as a Black writer, but I'll also be talking about Blackness and anti-Blackness more widely and how it impacts on my writing journey, but also on publishing. So it's going to be an A to Z, so there is a logic, there is a chronology, but just not the normal one. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. So you'd have the normal amount of clicking that you must be used to by now. There you go. Just to prove it. So all writers matter. This is a picture of me and Angie Thomas who wrote The Hate You Give and Concrete Rose and Angie's mum, Julia. It's at Waterstones for the uh, Waterstones Prize. I'd won the prize for older fiction previously and Angie was nominated for the prize for older fiction that year. But when I got there, her mum said to me, Patrice, I'm so pleased you're here. I thought you, we were the only brown people here. And even in that big crowded room in Waterstones in Piccadilly, there were still mostly, in terms of black people, really just us and possibly a few of the servers as well. So all writers matter, yes, and it's so important to be able to get your words on paper. And it's such a privilege to have your words in a book and such a joy for your mum to go into the bookshop to buy it. But I do wonder that we still aren't in a place where there are many black writers in the UK, especially. And also about what is happening for the next generation of black writers. If arts funding is being cut, how do we let that next generation of black writers know that their words are important, that their voices are important, and that the creativity and that splendid creativity that is bursting out of them is something that should be heard by many people. And this is one of the things that contribute to the difficulties, um, anti-blackness. This popped up just, I think, yesterday. Um, and I'm sure it's just a few people who complained to Ofcom that all the contestants were black and that there were no diversity, but actually it's still exhausting when you turn on social media and you're confronted with something like that. 
and Musa Akwanga, who's a writer, and also had a podcast with the footballer um, Ian Wright. He posted on uh, Twitter, not Twitter, sorry, Instagram on the 6th of um, May this. He said, it's very surreal at the moment. I'm having the best year of my career as an artist, but as a black person, I can remem can't remember a period in my life that has been so bleak. Things are going so well with the books and with the podcasts, but work really feels like escapism at the moment. I don't think I've ever had so many lengthy conversations with loved ones around the world about the racism that they're going through. This year has reminded me that there's no way to flee hate. You can't write your way out of it or earn your way out of it. It is a debate or debate your way out of it. At some point, you just have to stand there and let it hammer its way through you. And I thought, yes, absolutely. But I also felt that for me as a writer for children and young people, what can I do to change this? What can I do in the books that I write around representation, around positive messages, about making, making young black people the heroes that can help change that narrative? So let's talk about books. The first book or the UK book that's known to have a black protagonist was Petronella Breinberg's Sean's Red Bike. That was published in my lifetime in 1974, but that wasn't the books that I grew up with. I grew up with Blyton and Cinderella and Dr. Doolittle. I didn't live with my mum for the first four years and she's a massive writer, so, so, oh, so a massive reader. So some books like Little Women, she read and we read together. Cinderella was one of those early readers when you're looking at it and thinking, oh, we should wear a pink dress, we should wear a blue dress, we should wear a yellow dress. Alice in Wonderland, you know, Famous Five. Line of Witch the Wardrobe, I didn't read until my daughter was a, a, a baby. And then it was like, nah. Um, and then of course, Dr. Doolittle. I was a completist and read all, uh, all of Dr. Doolittle's. So what do those books tell me? Well, they tell me that people like me aren't in books and people like me don't write books. So they teach me about stories and cracking stories and what young people can do, but I had to do an ethnic hop every time I read them. But then you get a badger. And one of the books I did read um, that my mum passed to me was Wind in the Willows, which I loved. And I loved it because of Mole. And I loved it because of that episode where Mole wants to return to his burrow and he's feeling a bit homesick, but he's worried that his burrow is a bit shabby compared to rats. And then they go back and rat is incredibly empathetic. They find a tin opener and sardines and it's got food. So anything involving food will make me happy. But it reminded me of me growing up in a cul-de-sac in Sussex with an Italian stepdad and a Trinidadian mum. So like we were a family that were loud, good food, but very different, particularly as mum and Angelo, my stepdad, weren't married. And I thought that my friends wouldn't want to come back and play in my house with me because, well, we were different. But actually, Wind in the Willows taught you empathy. But the uh, reverse of that is the Dr. Doolittle books. I borrowed them all from the library when I was about six, and they are deeply racist. So this is an image uh, that Hugh Lofton used to illustrate his first book. I remember looking at this picture, Queen Ermintrude, who and her, I think her husband, um, and that is in some made up African country, and really at the age of six thinking, is that supposed to be black people like me? Or are they animals? And then there is this, this um, extract from Prince Bumpo, who's drawn as this very racist uh, caricature. If, only, if I were only a white prince, said he, with a dreamy faraway look in his eyes, then the parrot, talking in a small high voice like a little girl, said aloud, Bumpo, some, uh, someone might turn thee into a white prince perchance. The king's son started up off the seat and looked all around. So, yep. For the prince to get the princess, he had to be white. So again, the only images I saw of what could possibly be black people when I was a child was Hugh Lofting's. So all of those messages I absorbed. So B, books, badges, Cinderella, Dr. Doolittle. Let's get on to early years. Now, this is from A Child of Our Time, um, episode four in 2005. I've always sort of followed this because my daughter was born around the same time. Um, prior to becoming a full-time writer, I worked in early years policy around social justice. And there's still this idea that, you know, children are 
you know, are innocent, like children, you know, age three or four, don't see difference, even though we acknowledge that they see gender difference, but no, they, they children can't have racist views. Children absorb the values of society all around them, the explicit ones and the sort of more subtle ones. And in episode four of um, A Child um, of Our Time, they did an experiment. The experiment was led by Dr. John Sewage Blatchford and it was at the University of Kent. They had 136 children aged between three and five and they showed them four photographs. One was of a child described as Anglo-British, one was a child described as maybe African, African Caribbean, one was South Asian stroke Indian and one was described as East or Southeast Asian. And even at the age of three to five, the strongest negative bias was against the black child. These are preschool children. And I was also urge you to search on YouTube for a seven minute film called A Girl Like Me, made by an organization called Media That Matters and directed by um, then an African-American teenager called Kira da Davis. And as part of that, she explores um, how black children um, absorb negative messages about themselves from an early age. And she, again, she does an experiment that was first done in the 1940s with uh, 21 children, uh, children of color, to choose between two dolls, a black doll and a white doll. 15 out of 21 children chose the white dolls because they already associated the white dolls with being pretty and good and the black dolls with being ugly and bad. So what do we need? We need nuanced, positive stories these are essential for countering um, this bombardment of messages that children are getting from the age of naught about who is of value and who isn't. And also what we need is we need to show children of all backgrounds, but particularly those that are seen as less value, that they can tell stories, they can write stories, they can illustrate stories, that their own viewpoint is important. So I want to just go on to F, which is just a bit about me and family. I've never lived in a family where we're all the same colour. I've never lived in a family with my biological father. So these are some of my families. The first family in black and white with me looking like someone stolen my sweets is my um, a private fostering family. I lived in for the first four years while my mum was working to look after, uh, finishing her nursing training and finding somewhere for us to live. Then it's me with my mum by sort of um, the Thames, that's me and my Italian cousins, because at the bottom there's me, my mum and my Italian stepdad. My Italian stepdad has always called me his daughter. So people would look at him and would look at me and would look at him. I've always grown up in a family where we're questioned. And then below that picture of me as a child and my mum, that was my family then, that's my daughter, my daughter's dad and my then husband. So again, all different shades. Below that was me and my daughter when she was little and my auntie baby. Auntie baby is my mum's older sister and she'd been promising me for 40 years that she would come and visit me from Trinidad. So she came from when she was 80. So she's a repository of all the family stories. And in the middle, there's a picture of my, my biological father called Patrick Edward Singh. That gives you a little, a little hint of my, my background, um, who died when I was in my, when he was in his, his 40s. So, I have all these different strings to my family um, and I've never lived in a traditional family. So for me, these are the families that I want to write about. Different shapes, different colors, different, come from different parts of the world. And so many young people have that experience too. So up until I was in my thirties, I loved writing, but I would only write books with white characters in them because all those books I'd read as a child convinced me that we don't belong in books and that we barely deserve to write books. But these were some of the game changers for me and the game changers were books. The first is uh, Rumor God and Sididikoi, which I read when I was at primary school. It was um, televised as a series called Kizzy on BBC One. And my mum is very proudly a snob. So we were only allowed to watch BBC One as a kid. But um, Kizzy is part of uh, Gypsy Heritage. She has to le le leave her community when her grandma dies and she starts mainstream school where she is teased about her heritage. Basically, it's about racism. And as a child, I read that and it had all the things in it that I couldn't articulate about my own experience. 
pick up boy I saw the adaptation of that when I just become a mother so my daughter was two weeks old I was watching tv turned on the telly and it said oh my goodness and again BBC one thank you mum it was um, a black family it was a UK black family it's not a fresh prince of bel-air not um, a Cosby show it, was, it wasn't about racism or gangs or crimes it was about ethics and um loyalty and family and it's suddenly like this door opened and I thought oh I can write about those things I can put black families into books I can put my multicolored, untraditional family into books and the last one what about me I tried to find books with mixed race families in it when my daughter was little but it was very hard to find any and we were, I was walking down I think the South Bank in London saw this book bought it and my daughter was nine months old and would kiss the picture because she thought it was me. So if a child, a baby who's nine months old is looking for representation, you know, I thought, why on earth am I not fulfilling that? A H, of course, is for hot cross buns. This was like a street a screen grab of um, uh, Prue Leith in the Great British Bake Off a few years ago. It was festival week. And she said, the most obvious festival bun to us is a hot cross bun at Easter. To us, to us, not to me, to us. And one of the things when you're a sort of um, minoritized uh, identity is you're always dealing with the us and them. Who is the we? Who is the majority that is being assumed? It's not always me. And again, with publishing as an industry, it's looking at who is the we? Who are we are? Uh, the, the people who work within publishing, but who are the we, who are the consumers, who are we publishing for? And quite often, again, it's not those minoritized communities. And I wanted you to think again about this, the invisible majority, the we. This was from the beginning of lockdown from about a year ago. Um, and this is on Bournemouth Beach. And this is when people, I think, should have been social distancing. And the majority of people in there are white. And though it's reported, there was never a mention of whiteness. Meanwhile, in an LBC interview this morning, a Calder Valley MP said, what I've seen in my constituency is that we have areas of our community, sections of our community, that are just not taking a pandemic seriously. Asked to clarify whether he was referring to the Muslim community, he replied, of course, and when you look at the areas where you've seen rises in cases, the vast majority, but not by any stretch of their imagination, are not all areas, but it is the BME communities that are not taken as seriously enough. So again, people, brown people get named, white people don't. And because white people don't get named, it doesn't get mentioned, it's down to individual actions. It's not down to a white majority, it's down to individuals. But because you get, re it's the reinforcement that people of color do this, the BME community, the Muslim community, the black community, we're the, the minority that um, are letting things down. And I suppose just adding to that point, just checking my notes, that whiteness is often never mentioned unless it's making a point about inequality. So for instance, uh, one of the things that used to pop up quite a lot when I was thinking about it, when I used to work in policy, was the comment about, what about white working class boys? Well, actually, when we looked at educational inequalities, um, black working class boys were doing worse than white, work, white working class boys, but race is quite often uh, politicized and whiteness is only used to politicize. So again, that makes me think as a, as a, as a black writer, am I a black writer? Am I a writer? How do I have this discussion? Because sometimes the words are taken away from you. But luckily, you have people like Geoffrey Boachi who gives the words back to you. Geoffrey has written this book, many books. This one's called Blacklisted and I absolutely recommend it. Uh, Geoffrey is a teacher. He was a Londoner and now lives in Doncaster with his family and has written several, several books that explore race from a UK um, perspective. So that's what makes it special. And in Blacklisted, he goes through many of the words that are used to describe blackness. So the words like BAME, which I personally don't like, I don't find it offensive, but it just means nothing. People that are vaguely brown, but might not be brown. And what it does is it cloaks different experiences between different uh, groups. So it means that me, second generation, born in the UK, are uh, sort of 
grouped in the same person who might be um, born in the Philippines and sort of 30 years younger than me, different experiences. And he, um, the words he goes from, you know, talks about some of the so-called neutral words, uh, Afro-Caribbean, mixed race, working class, personal descriptors, white sounding forename, black sounding surname, derogatory terms, things like coloured and worse, um, loaded terms, blackness and white gaze, like exotic, lunchbox, internal descriptors for us by us, dark skinned, light skinned, token, terms of endearment, fan blood, painting, internal insults, sell out, um, outlaw accolades, bad man, gangster, player, politics, conscience, ignorance, get it, it's very funny, actually, honestly. And he's also just written a book called Musical Truth, looking at um, the history, Black British history, through sort of musical tracks. Um, and I just thought, oh, why didn't I think of that? But I really recommend buying Jeffrey's book to think about how we use words and what words mean. Because often people say, oh, I'm scared of using that word, I'm scared of saying that. Well, there you go. There's a book to help you understand the resonance between certain words. Okay. Keeping that gay, I'd feel bad if I didn't have like a Lord of the Rings reference. So there we are in Helm Deep and there's uh, Legolas saying to Gimli, the dwarf, you can see the top of his shiny helmet. Should I describe it to you? Would you like me to find you a box? As a black writer, well, as a writer in publishing, sometimes you feel you just cannot see the full landscape of publishing unless you have access to that world beforehand, if you, unless you know about it, it it is very hard to make out. And I didn't know about it before I was published. But also as a black writer, sometimes you think, do I put my head above that parapet? Do I talk about race? Do I talk about my experience? Because looking back to that, you know, that Alan uh, Carr slide, are people going to uh, shoot you down? And I have refused things before because I thought, you know what? I don't feel I could deal with like, the racist rape, rape threats that I'd get on Twitter, Twitter if I do that. But also let's talk about who the gatekeepers are in publishing. We have agents, editors, sales staff, marketing, booksellers, book buyers, librarians, reviewers, book bloggers, literary festival organizers, um, and yourself, myself, my constant thought, am I good enough? Am I the diversity option? I would really recommend reading a Rethink, Rethinking Diversity in Publishing, which was uh, published by uh, uh, Dr. Anna Saha and Dr. Sandra Van Lente. Um, and it was published, oh, I think, last year. And again, that was a survey in the UK about different people in publishing about why we still aren't where we should be with uh, diversity. Well, libraries, of course, libraries and librarians, and just thanking all the librarians, particularly school librarians, have put my book into children's hands. M, mirror and map. Um, I'm sure you've heard by now um, the quote by Dr. Readingson's Bishop about children's literature should be a uh, mirror to see themselves reflected, a window to look through, a sliding door to push aside to walk through. But also Christopher Myers wrote an article in the um, New York Times called The Apartheid of Children's Literature. And he says that children's literature should also, can also be a map. You read it and you can see where you want to go. And I'll come back to that in a moment. N, niche. And again, it's a conversation about what books by black writers are considered by mainstream predominantly white publishing as saleable. What are the books that we write that are considered ones that are saleable by white publishers. Um, if you look on the internet, you'll see that in, 200, in 2014, there was kind of a um, survey of the covers of books that mentioned Africa, and they just placed them all together. And it's like, you know, African sunset, acacia trees, all that same sort of vibe. And it's a sense about where are we pigeonholed? What do people think we should be writing about? There was a spate when I was receiving quite a few books from UK and uh, from US publishers, but African American writers, um, and all of them involved at the beginning a black boy being shot. So I received Ghost Boys by uh, Jewel Parker Rhodes, I think, um, The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas, um, Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds. 
they were great books, but actually it is exhausting. If those are the only books that have been handed out to black boys in the UK, been bought by black uh, UK publishers. Here, here's a book, you've been shot again. Again, what message is that? And also I think by putting books in niches, um, we're disrespecting readerships. I think the readership can read widely. And one of the issues I think in publishing is that the editors who acquire books have little opportunity to get out and meet young people, particularly in children's publishing. They don't get to meet the young people in schools, the young people just on buses, um, in youth clubs and reading groups who are buying these books. So they actually don't know. And I think a lot of what they decide to buy might be shaped by their own experiences of, of reading. Oh, own voices. It's sometimes controversial. Um, and I think it's slightly different in the UK from that is uh, in the US. Um, but one of the things I sometimes get asked is sometimes by white writers as well, will I get published if I write a possibly character of colour? I'm not psychic, I don't know. But actually, that's not really the question that people are asking. Um, we can all write what we want. Nobody's checking our laptops and notepads. Will you get published? Many writers of colours don't get published while writing characters of colour. Um, will um, an agent um, uh, take you on? Depends on that agent's views. If you get published, will you get uh, grief on Twitter for writing outside your lane? Lots of writers have written, uh, white writers written characters of colour and haven't done so. It's just when something blips quite badly, people do now take to Twitter. But also there's a whole conversation about white writers writing about characters of colour, getting big advances that writers of colours don't get for writing about their own communities. Um, so there are lots of, you know, it is actually more complex about being told about what you can and can't write. And also for me, the thing about writing own voices is that you can have little in-jokes. When I write a, a book, um, Firstly, for instance, if I'm writing a book with a character who's have had experience of the care system, I think, what if a young person with experience of the care system picks up that book? I don't want them to feel bad about themselves. I want them to feel it's relatable, but also I want them to think that, you know, she's got the in-jokes. And as a writer of colour, I can put in in-jokes about being a writer of colour, ones that I don't think a white writer could or should write about. So going back to thinking of Hugh Lofting and those caricatures, my daughter and I have got an ongoing um, joke about lips and about how, even though I love expensive lipstick, you know, why on earth I didn't inherit better, bigger lips to put it on. Um, I recently sent her something for, um, to sort of uh, a salve for her lips from wearing masks. And she texted me again, it says here that it's for plumping up lips. Are you trying to tell me something? And I can put all of those things in books, which I think if you're not an own voices writer, you can't or shouldn't. So PQR, publishing, quality, relatability. Um, this was a, um, a tweet from Amanda Craig, who's a writer and reviewer. I do long for children's books to be less about issues and more about storytelling and imagination. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> if you look at any really good ones, they explore issues like loneliness, bullying, disability, etc. But they don't address them. Children know when they're being got at. It's not something I personally agree with that, maybe because people would consider I write about issues, but hey. But what it did again make me think about the gatekeepers, about who decides what, what is quality and what isn't. Big publishers is a business, it has to make money. Um, it's, it's risk averse, you know, so therefore you've got this, uh, celebrities, you've got the sort of concentrated marketing on certain books, but also you've got, you know, to some degree relatability to, to gatekeepers. Um, certainly, you know, before um, J.K. Rowling became more controversial with lots of people in publishing, most of the sort of uh, people I met in uh, publishing and writers absolutely adored the Harry Potter books. So I think many people were looking for something that inspired that same feeling in them. But interesting, going back to that rethinking diversity in publishing uh, report, it says, in an industry that is dominated by the white middle classes, many of whom attended Russell Group universities, notion of quality is shaped by a very particular experience, a canon that now is questioned for its Eurocentric view. And even if your book is published, even if your book sort of slips through, you need a champion. 
And I know my book, Orange Boy, and I've said it as again, was only accepted by one editor, and that's Emma Roberts, and she was my champion. And it's because of her that my book was submitted to uh, prizes, that it won prizes, that built my career. Um, she had to sell it, you know, within a, the sort of publishers, to the salespeople, to her manager, you know, um, without her, I wouldn't have, have had this career now. So you need to find that champion who gets your book. But if publishing isn't that diverse, how are those um, books that are seen as non-traditional finding their, their champions? S, we're getting to a bit heavy stuff now, structural racism and stereotypes. Um, a re government report, as you may know, by the Commission on Race uh, and Ethnic Disparities was criticised for concluding that structural racism doesn't really exist. Um, and so let us think really, uh, or let me think how my identity is shaped as a black woman is shaped by hundreds of years of history. So let's go back to scientific racism. So Carl Linnaeus, he had like a, his main thing was um, categorizing plants, but he thought he'd have a go at categorizing people as well. Um, so he, these are his categories, the Europeans, white, sanguine, brown, abundant long hair, blue eyes, gentle, cute, inventive, covered with close specimens and governed by laws. Um, and then at the bottom of the heap, you've got Africans. And I read actually what I have written down here, which is slightly different from there. So what I've written down here was taken from actually a website about um, uh, Linnaeus, I think Linnaean website. So Africanus, black, phlegmatic, lazy, dark hair with many twisting braids, silky skin, gee, thanks Carl, flat nose, swollen lips, I wish, woman with elongated labia, breast lactating profusely. Calm down, Carl. Uh, sly, sluggish, and neglectful. And then we've got Chris, uh, Christopher um, Mayers, I think. So it's my writing is so bad. Mid late 18th century. Talked about a beautiful white race and an ugly black race. Georges Cuvier's The White Race of Oval Face, Straight Hair and Nose, to which the civilized people of Europe belong and which appear to be the most beautiful, beautiful of all, is, is also superior to the others by its genius. Um, courage and, and uh, activity. So scientific racism, but unfortunately, these have shaped many of the stereotypes that stay with us um, about black people being lazy, lustful, hypersexual, um, shameless, you know, about uh, East and South Asian people as well, um, and white people being at the top of the heap. And again, one of the big criticisms of the report, the Tony Sewell report, was that we were back to hierarchies. And this time, people of Caribbean descent were at the bottom of that hierarchy. We were the ones who uh, are challenging, lazy, and just won't toe the line. And when we think about, you know, Black people now, we are sitting on top of this heap of history, of colonialism, of racism, and many of the tentacles from it still stretch through society today. See Thanos, because you really have to, don't you, I think. So why have we got a bit of a gratuitous titan? Well, actually, I should have really put the Black Panther. It was the fifth highest growing superhero or film of all time, not just Marvel, but actually also of Marvel, because the first four were Marvel through, uh, through and through. And also it shows you what you can do. You can have a film, spend lots of money for it, many Black cast, and it can have the in-jokes. It can have different elements of Blackness. It can have creativity, it can have celebration, it can have kick-ass women fighters, it can have dark-skinned women. It's a sort of representation that I want to do. So are black books uns unsellable? Well, look up, uh, written by Nathan uh, Bryan and, and um, illustrated by uh, Dapai Adeola. It won the Waterstones Prize in 2020 and has sold more than 50,000 copies. But also thinking of Christopher Myers, a map, a mirror, a window, a sliding door. If you go on Instagram or Twitter and World Book Day and see those little, those black children, we could finally have something for them, like the Black Panther. They can dress up, they can go to school, they can feel proud. If you have never understood what it's like, like to not see yourself represented, go on Twitter and understand what black parents are feeling, because at last, this is for them. 
But it's just really the Voices series and what you can do when you put your mind to it and want change. So this was commissioned by Tony Bradman, who's a white children's writer, been around for a really long time. Well, she and David Olasugo's programme of Black British History thinking, I didn't know that. So he put in a proposal to Scholastics for a series of books that are inspired by UK, and again, important, UK Black and, um, and Asian history. So we've got um, Bally Ray but talking about um, Indian um, soldiers at Dunkirk. I wrote about the Tudor time, the Mary Rose, you know, um, Emma Norrie's written about Pablo Franque. Um, so there's a whole a series of them. And I get contacted a lot by primary school teachers now, wanting me to talk about Diver's Daughter, wanting me to talk about the Tudors, so I can talk about alternative histories. It's out there. And even though the curriculum is so narrow, there are a lot of uh, teachers, English teachers, history teachers, librarians, who want to widen a children's thinking and want the change. W naturally is for Benedict Wong, because I think that's important. Now, Benedict Wong is an actor and he was born in Eccles in Lancashire. And the first thing I, I, I ever came across him was in the series 15 Stories High, which is kind of weird misanthropic sitcom with, with Sean Locke. And he's kind of like a slightly naive, sweet guy with a very strong Northern accent. And then he sort of kind of popped up in later films. I looked at um, uh, his internet movie database sort of list and you just think, oh my days. So Last of the Science, Summer Wine, Chinese man. In Frank Stubbs, the series, in the episode called Chinatown, he's Lee. In the series Heart to Mind, he's Chinese interpreter. Um, he's all types of variation of East Asian, Southeast Asian, including Nepalese. In the wrong man, sort of John over of um, James Corden's, he is the dodgy Chinese businessman. In Marvel, he is Wong. You know, he's played with a slightly enigmatic, cringingly stereotyped character. And then I was watching uh, What We Do in the Shadows and I saw, and thought, oh my gosh, a bit more Orientalism, here we go again. And then he starts talking and he has a northern accent. I thought, yeah, whether that's deliberate or not, it's just playing against this sort of stereotype. And I suppose, why have I got Benedict Wong? I suppose it just reminds me about, if I was a child of Chinese heritage thinking, I want to be an actor, I can do anything. I'm second generation, born in, in like the northern of England. I'm a northerner, I'm a comedian. What are you gonna end up? You're gonna end up playing a Chinese interpreter in Chinatown. And this is what we've got to change with books. We've got to change the representation, change the stereotypes, change what we think children can be and see of each other and of themselves. So X is for <clears throat> Warrior Queen. Uh, this actually is Yaren Sintal, uh, who was uh, um, in, in sort of what we now call Ghana. And she, in her 60s, she had to take up arms and fight the British um, against colonialism. She lost and got exiled, but she was still kick-ass. I was recently researching a book about pre-colonial Africa and about all the warrior queens, and it just reminded me of how much I don't know and about how we don't have a narrative about how people in the African countries um, themselves fought against um, Europe from the 15th century onward. We don't know about the empires. We don't know about the scramble for Africa and how that impacted on the nations. I grew up with live aid and famine and about, you know, white European nations offering all this aid to, to Europe, uh, to Africa, but that is only one side of the story. And again, what I see as a, my role as a writer is to change that narrative. So finally, so yeah, why so it was work for Yara Santara is Zadie Smith. Sadie Smith has finally joined us as a children's writer. And I just think the title of the book says it all, Weirdo. Yeah, we are, and I love it. Thank you for listening to my talk, and I look forward to some questions.
Patrice, thank you so much for your lecture. It was delightful. Uh, I hope you enjoyed giving it. Um, we do have a, a number of questions, but I'm going to ask you a question of my own first, because one of the, um, it, you came and lectured to my uh, course on Black Britain and children's literature in, was it November? And during that time, one of the students who wrote about her, wrote about your books in her essay, she said that you were writing about Britain as a hostile environment. And I wondered what you thought of that, because I thought that was a really interesting comment. And I wondered if you agreed with that. I don't think it was necessarily deliberate, but I think probably the hostility is towards not necessarily only young people of color, but sometimes just to young people, full stop, mm -hmm. I think, and the way young people are treated, but also about the young people who are additionally sort of thrown to the sort of sidelines. So the young people who have experienced family imprisonment, young people have experienced um, the care system. And I think society is hostile. I think there's a number of narratives that sort of thread through society about different types of people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I try and write about them to actually bring them back in and to, and to give them a voice. So possibly I've never thought about it like that, but I suppose the reason I write about them is because of the hostility or the voicelessness or the stereotypes that are projected on them. So like, wow, thank you, student. <laughs> I know, <laughs> oh, I thought I was really comment. I thought, hmm, maybe I need to steal that. So. <laughs> yeah. um, well, that kind of leads into this first question from Mark who asks, why do you feel it's important for young people to read about such difficult topics um, as drug use and criminal activity? Simply because they're there. That is our society, I think. And I think there's two things, really. There's the things if, you know, if you have experienced that either now or within your family, and a surprising amount of families experience um, drug use within a family. So, and if you haven't, you know, it helps you understand other people's experiences. So I think, you know, there are wide ranges of books. And of course, I think we do want to, to sort of um, experience escapism. I'm a bigger Lord of the Rings fan. <laughs> you know, I can quote more the film than, than, than the sort of books. Too many elf songs in the books. But, um, you know, I, I love a bit of escape. I love a bit of formulaic, you know, American crime drama that would never happen. But also for myself as a young person, I think I was... You know, I'm the first in my family to be born in, in Britain. I was, I was brought up in Sussex in a very sort of white society. Um, I didn't have particularly many problems, but maybe part of that is because my mum was brought up in sort of colonial Trinidad, so I'd absorbed right. quite a lot of those sort of colonised values. So, but no matter how hard I tried to fit in, there were lots of things telling me that I didn't fit in. Yeah. So perhaps I'm also always looking at things as an outsider as, as well. Yeah. Um, so when I write books, I want young people who have experienced those to feel that they're inside and to feel that they matter, and that they can have a voice, but also that they can be heroes, you know, that yeah. they can they can solve the mystery, that they can have hope, you know, all of those things. They can hold the poetry in their voices. So yeah. I think, yeah, simply I write about them because they exist. And right. certainly in all the jobs I've done before as a full-time writer, I know, you know, I've heard those voices and heard families and young people talk about it. And, and Michelle asks, what are the main differences between writing for adults and writing for children? And, and maybe that connects to that idea of wanting to give a voice, but is, is it that? Well, there's two things for me. I think one, it's about the moral compass of a book. And I think writing for um, children and, and young adults, I'm very, very aware of my responsibility and of the messages that are in my, my book. So I'm very thoughtful about, for instance, about young women having agency over their own bodies. I'm thoughtful about issues around consent. Um, if bad things happen, I want there to be consequences. Because mm -hmm. uh, I could imagine, for instance, reading a book, and I don't know if I did, but imagine reading a book when I was uh, younger, if somebody called somebody a racist name and then didn't get any, you know, told off for it, what that yep. would feel to me. So there's that about consequences and being actually more explicit about that. And for me, and this is personally me as a writer, it's about hope. I think you can be more ambivalent in an adult book because you don't feel so responsible. Whereas mm. I think for me, writing for young people, even though they deal with quite difficult, issue, difficult issues, I want there to be hope. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's also one third thing I think for me is I'm also very conscious of, I suppose related to the first things about very, being very conscious of the reader. So when I wrote Indigo Donuts about a young woman who's care experienced, my first thought is what if somebody who's care experienced picks up this book, how will they see themselves? So again, I think it's a stronger sense of that responsibility to the reader and awareness of them. So do you read your books 
over and over, you know, from those perspectives? Do you uh, deliberately sit down and think about yourself as a person in care? How would they, how would they hear this book? Yeah, that's my starting point. Um, and I read quite a lot of memoirs relate, mm. written sort of first, you know, first person by people. So not literary, I do read, you know, a couple of literary memoirs, but I find the ones that work most. So for instance, Vindigo Donut, I read Hackney Child about a woman who'd gone through right. sort of the care yep. system. Um, I read also a book by I think a guy called Richard McCann, whose um, whose mother was one of the first people who was killed by Peter Sutcliffe mm -hmm. and what it was like being a child of a sex worker and how the police or the people treated her murder. Right. Um, so those first hand voices. So I think, you know, if you read those, it's very, you know, it it would be it would feel so, so wrong to sort of counter those voices. You absorb those voices and you want to give those voices justice so yeah my starting point is how would i feel if i was so yeah, yeah also it feels too exploitative if you don't do that yeah um emma wants to know um speaking of g for gatekeepers she says uh <laughs> can you can you tell us a little about representation in publishing houses how would things be different were there to be more black editors prs salespeople in those spaces i think it's kind of a complex thing because it, I think there's an interplay of ethnicity, uh, but it's also interplay of class, there's an interplay of so many different things. So for instance, you might have more black editors, but for instance, if they're second generation and all gone to Russell Group universities, <laughs> you might not necessarily get that degree of change. Yeah. And I think uh, if publishing houses wanted to change, they, they really could because, you know, the bigger publishing houses are a sort of corporation. So you'd actually use a very, you know, a, a project management model, really. You think, what is our vision? What do we want to see? How do we know when we've achieved it? And we'll set various goals and targets. So, you know, short-term goals, medium-term goals, long-term goals would monitor. And then would also, you know, they'd have um, uh, sort of um, processes, like I'm thinking about myself in the voluntary sector, some of the things that they did. You'd have, you'd have regular supervision. So every six weeks you'd have supervision, you'd talk to your manager about your own personal goals, about your challenges, but also they would ask about equality and social justice as a sort of very specific, you yeah. know, topic. You'd have exit interviews, you'd ask specifically, particularly if you'd notice that maybe certain people are leaving, mm. um, you'd want to find out why. Also, yeah. you'd just also be very honest, because I think, you know, particularly bigger publishing houses are businesses. So although, you know, they might want to have a, a, a social justice element, actually their role is to make money for stakeholders. Mm. So therefore, you know, they, they may commission work from uh, authors with problematic views if they sell a lot you know, be honest about it you know oh, yeah. actually you're saying one thing yeah. and doing the other but if you're honest about it people can make up their minds where and how they, what they, they want, want to, to do. work yeah. but I think yeah it's you know it's organizations can do it there's lots of models out there there's lots of information out there but in the end it's actually really strongly having a vision that's led from the top down with yeah. strong expectations about what you want to see and everybody buying into that or else it's just bit by bit yeah. or diversity initiatives that kind of pick away at it but relies on individuals changing themselves not organizations changing themselves yes well that is the uh, general problem you can uh, deal with individual racists but you need to deal with the institutional and broad uh, cultural racism that exists um, throughout industries um speaking of uh what you can do. Uh, you talked a little bit about Tony Bradman and voices, and I, I'm, I think that voices series is really interesting. In fact, I'm reading the most recent one. Um, I was reading it right before uh, we, we came on air, actually. Um, and I wondered, because it does certain eras of uh, certain periods of time, are there any periods of time that you would like to see them do? Uh, Oh, I was quite like a bit of Georgian stuff in there. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I've been reading those, but also, you know, if we think about, you know, Georgian times and the sort of height of enslavement and plantation owners, but also when, you, um, you know, you've got hands slown and the sort of start of artifacts coming over, the start of the British Museum, a lot of the statues that were are problematic are around that time. So I'd love something about activists around that time or conversations that enable schools to talk about why some of these statues are so sort of uh, uh, problematic. Um, I'm trying to sort of think, because I've kind of got, I've got, I've kind of got Roman, I've got lots of Victorian, you've got Windrush. Um, and, you know, but I suppose the thing is, it's like, 
there are so many different stories from each era anyway, so many different yeah. ways of looking at it. Yes. So, you know, I think it'd be great if some of them are duplicated, actually, if you had more than one, if you had a different Tudor story. If you had, yeah, that would be so, exciting, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's what happens with those series. You have one Tudor story, one Victorian story, et cetera. So, yeah, that's a good idea. We should suggest that to Tony. <laughs> so. yeah, we'll do. <laughs> okay. Um, Lizzie asks, is there someone who has inspired you or acted as a role model throughout your career? I think it's different people at uh, uh, sort of different times. I think one of the people in my sort of, you know, actually my 30s who helped me really think differently was uh, the African-American ap academic Bell Hooks. And I was trying to work out, can I get her in B? Can I get her in H? <laughs> but um, I'm sure she's popped up in some others. And the reason why is because she answered some a question that I didn't know I could ask in a sense. So mm. when I grew up in this, when I was a sort of teenager in the sort of 1980s, there were lots of sort of romantic comedies that mainly starred like Sandra Bullock or um, Meg Ryan or, and I kind of watched loads of them, but I knew that I as a black woman could never be that heroine. I could never get the guy, not that I wanted to judge myself, I shouldn't judge myself by like, you know, <laughs> my attractiveness to men, but yeah. because you've absorbed. But that's you the know. goal of the romantic comedy, isn't it? So. But also you've absorbed, you know, particularly, you know, with darker skin and with, with my features, you kind of absorbed messages that you're ugly, that you're valueless. Your mum might tell you otherwise, but that's your mum, you know, of course. because yes. <laughs> you're not in books, you're not in films, you're not in TV. And there's all of that, you know, you're not in a makeup counter in boots. You'd have to get a special makeup, you know, yeah. all of those things, <laughs> which is a teenager is kind of really quite, you it's know, stressful. quite, quite harsh. And I think the spell hooks, I think it was either real to real or black looks when she talked about the subjectivity of being a black woman that you could look through your own eyes and disagree. You know, Julia Roberts yeah. isn't the most beautiful woman in the world. Yeah. You know? um, all of those things that made me think, oh, I can actually have a point of view that's not the mainstream, that the mainstream is white, that mine might be different. Mm. And I'm allowed to have that because you sort of also grow up. And again, that's something you can explore in books, knowing that you can't challenge, the, if you challenge the status quo or mention race in a predominantly sort of um, white environment, it is really tough. I first learned that at primary <laughs> school. <Yes. laughs> so you just like stay quiet and you don't talk about it. And Bell Hooks gave me permission to talk about it and gave me permission to think about myself as um, that my own experiences were valid and not wrong for not being white experiences. So she sort of just gave me courage. And then Mallory Blackman, you know, writing as a UK black writer, writing about black families. It was like, oh my gosh, it was literally that moment thinking, after all, you know, 30 odd years of not feeling I could write about me or my family and that were invalid, that, you know, it was like, aha. And I like found my writing voice through that. Yeah. Yeah. And the nice thing about Mallory Blackman's work, a lot of it is has those black families, but it's not about racism. It's not about the, you know, the period of enslavement, you know, it, it, it exactly. is regular families doing regular things and you need both, you know, exactly. you need all. <laughs> so, well, um, that, there was that conversation, you know, about, about black British history, about if everything we get is about enslavement, you know, what are we telling children, yeah. but we do need to talk about it because yeah. it still has repercussions. So it is about the everything, everything, and that, yeah. Um, yeah. And that Christopher Myers, the map, you know, we've got the mirror and whatever, it's a map. We need to show children and young people where they can go. Yeah. And yeah, as well as where they came from. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sarah asks, uh, I would like to widen my reading. Are there any books out there right now by new or upcoming authors of color that you would recommend? Um, I, I think so, so I'll be lazy and say, have a look at the Jalak Prize, J-H-A-L-A-K <laughs> Prize, and their website because they... Um, You've been reading a, a lot of those, haven't you? <laughs> You've been reading a lot of those, uh, well, especially the, uh, one of them, perhaps, because you're on it this year. So. <laughs> yes, yeah, but the long list, the previous long list, you know, there's lots of lots of books on there. Also look up, it depends, you know, if you're looking for children, young, for ch younger children, look up Letterbox Library, who aren't a library, they're an ethical online bookseller, but yeah. they have fantastic lists of, lists of, of, of books. Um, you know, there are more coming, you know, coming through, I think. And I suppose my fear is that publishers might have had a moment following Black Lives Matters where they feel we, we need to write, you know, and what I hope is all the black writers coming through will actually have careers, second books, yes. third books, also be sometimes, you know, allowed to have a book that doesn't sell very well, but still think you're amazing that will, you know, will yes. get through. But what I would ask is 
look for UK black uh, black authors and UK authors of color because publishers yes, please. <laughs> you have a habit of bringing in US authors, which are great, but you know, there is a period when a lot of the African American authors that were being brought in were writing books about black boys that are getting shot. So I remember just reading three in a row and thinking, if these are the books that are being handed to black guy, black boys in school, saying, like, oh, read this. It's like, by the third time they got shot, they must be thinking, really? <laughs> what are you trying to say to me? <laughs> exactly. Okay, well, we uh, have time for one final question, and it's from James. And uh, actually, James, just to let you know, I, I sneakily asked Patrice this earlier, so uh, you're on trend. Uh, J James asks, are you writing anything now? If so, can you share any details? Yes, I am. Um, I've got a uh, young adult book coming out in uh, mid-August called Splinters of Sunshine. And it's sort of taken the character Benny from um, Eight Pieces of Silver, the DNA dad. He's come out yeah. of prison and he's like gone to find his sort of next son down, Spay, who's 15. Spay's mixed heritage, but could pass as white, lives with his white mum. And he's like really academic. But his yeah. friend D, who you knew from sort of playgroup, has is quite vulnerable, has gone missing, and she might be on the south coast, part of a county line sort of sort of drug selling. She's also like, um, hence the dress, really into wildflowers, which was her gift from her nan. So her, I suppose, approach of her voice is a lot to wildflowers. So Spay and his dad, Benny, go on a sort of road trip down to try and, and, and find her. So that's our I like aim. road trip novels. Lots of Queen. Well, the music, lots of Queen. I kind of I pulled back on <laughs> Marvel. There might be a random Marvel and a bit of from just get Inception, I think, in there for Christopher Nolan. But I kind of pulled back on that. But so yeah, yes, that's out. And then a couple of stories and anthologies, um, middle grade anthologies from, from one from Nights of called Happy, Happy Here. And Eggman to do like a crime anthology again for sort of middle grade. So one there as well. Very good. We're, we will definitely look out for those. Uh, I'm afraid that's all we have time for tonight. Uh, thank you again, Patrice, for uh, partic participating in the Insights Lecture Series. Um, and uh, we hope to see you up here in Newcastle again soon. Thanks to our audience for watching. And I would add also that uh, the next event in the Insights Lecture Series will actually be on Thursday. And it is the Jacobson Lecture on long COVID, what will be the legacy from the pandemic? And hopefully some of you in the audience will come and uh, demand to know what the uh, legacy will be on young people, because I think that that's gonna be really, really important. So thank you again, and we hope you have a good evening.